All right, we are going to end this series of videos for this module on anthropometry. Now, many of you guys already know what that is, and but you may not have heard that term before. So when we say anthropometry, we are basically talking about measuring someone's height, someone's weight, their waist circumference, the width of you know their hip to waist ratio. Um, and so all of those things are kind of under this umbrella of anthropometry, okay? Um, and I'm gonna talk about each one of those in detail. Here are some tools that we can use to measure those. Um, they can measure distances and widths and circumferences. Um, we have a few of those that we'll use in lab as well, okay? So circumferences, basically how we use the principle of anthropometry is that we know that circumferences affect fat mass, muscle mass, and skeletal size. And in many ways, someone's circumference can be indicative of a health status. Um, skeletal size is directly related to lean body mass, so, and that makes sense because we know that the more dense their tissue, the more lean body mass they have. Um, and we also know that body to height indices should be highly related to body fat, but independent of height if used to estimate percent of body fat, okay? Um, so now I'm gonna go over some of the, um, the relationships between anthropometry and estimations of body fat. Now, to be clear, body circumference, waist to hip ratio, all of SAD, all of those measurements are not an estimation of percent body fat. Those are anthropometrics, right? But you can use anthropometric data to then try to estimate percent body fat, although typically it's not done. You use one of the field measurements like skin folds um, or BIA to measure percent body fat, okay? Um, anthropometrics is more appropriate than skin folds for some people, and that includes people who are very obese um, because there tends to be less error. People who are obese tend to have not just subcutaneous tissue, but they also tend to have a lot of visceral tissue. And remembering that your um, skin folds are not really able to measure visceral tissue at all, okay? Um, anthropometric equations estimate uh, body density, percent body fat, and fat-free mass. Um, and again, there's general and then population specific equations, okay? Um, to be clear, we really won't go over a lot of those equations in this class because in, in the field, you either are measuring or estimating body fat percentage with field-based measures like BIA or um, skin folds, or you're looking at anthropometrics. You're not usually, usually using anthropometrics to estimate body fat percentage, okay? Um, body mass index, BMI, hopefully you all know how to calculate that. Um, I'm happy to go over that in lab a little bit more if you need help. But BMI is a predictor of cardiovascular disease, right? Uh, it's a predictor of type 2 diabetes. Uh, we know that these disease states are directly related to someone's BMI category. Now, BMI is not great for everyone, and we all know that, right? So if you're someone who's an athlete and you tend to have more lean body mass, your weight is going to be high. So that ratio of weight to height is gonna be slightly altered in that your BMI might be in that unhealthy or overweight or obese category, okay? Um, and so that's just kind of important to know. I know BMI gets a bad rap, but from a public health perspective, BMI is actually a pretty helpful tool to look at the health of a community. Waist circumference is literally looking at someone's circumference of their weight. And it has been shown to be a pretty good predictor of someone's um, obesity-related health status and health risk. So what we know is that men who have a waist circumference of 102 or greater um, and women who have a waist circumference of 88 centimeters and greater are technically considered obese, right? And if you remember your ACSM stratification, um, that's kind of one of those uh, cutoffs. But I actually have a classification on this chart here that might be a little helpful for you. So what people are trying to get um, for their BMI is going to be anywhere from 25 to 29. So obesity is going to be anything that's greater than 30. So what you all need to know is that you can use BMI as a way of looking at obesity, but you could also use waist circumference. BMI, anything greater than 30, waist circumference 102 and 88 centimeters for men and women respectively. So waist to hip ratio is another way of looking at anthropometrics and we know that it's directly related to cardiovascular disease as well as different metabolic diseases. 
Um, and all you're literally doing is taking your waist measurement and you divide by the hip measurement and making sure that those measurements are in the same units. That's really important. Okay, and so um, this is a nice table so you can kind of look at based on your sex, men or women, and your age, and it has the different age categories, you can see whether you are low, moderate, high, or very high risk. And this is a very commonly used measurement tool um, by fitness professionals and something that maybe some of your clients even might come and ask you for because it's used in a medical setting. So a lot of the physicians will talk to their clients about knowing what their waist to hip circumference is. Um, waist to height ratio. So now it's not just waist to hip, it's waist to height. Okay, um, and you, it's a good measure of central obesity. Um, and you basically look at your waist circumference and you divide by your height. Uh, it's a good predictor of obesity related diseases. Um, and essentially the goal is you want your waist circumference, the, the circumference around your waist to be less than half of your height. Um, so basically if it's anything greater than 0.5, then you're at a higher risk. Now this is one that's not seen as much in our field, but certain human performance labs use it. I used it when I was at Colorado State, and it's the sagittal abdominal diameter, and that's the acronym SAD is the one that's used. So when I said SAD earlier today, that's what I meant, okay? Um, and it's an indirect measure of visceral fat. So again, knowing that visceral fat is very commonly found around the abdomen, that's why this measurement tool is used. Okay, and it's the distance from the small of the back of the spine to the upper abdomen, and you can see that in that photo. Um, and you measure this either having the person supine laying down or standing. Usually it's easier when they're laying down and you can kind of see why um, the device is kind of this big metal device and it can be easier when someone's just kind of rather motionless laying down.